can. Here. Bree. Here. Naomi. Here. Stephanie. Absent. Paul. Here. Chad, absent. Gabe. Here. Thank you. James. Present. Alex. Here. Thank you. Taylor here. Alan. Present. Thank you. OK, so now we have the approval of the agenda. Is anyone opposed to our current agenda? Paul, then Mike. Might be the same thing. Um, I'd like to add uh, under the budget committee that we do a quick report back from the BRC meeting today. Is that anyone be, opposed? Like, I'm deep. So moved. BRC. Okay, Mike. Yes, uh, mine's actually quite a little different. Um, I'd like to motion to make us official, but like um, put our elections manager updates underneath the advisor updates. Okay. So um, that would be M on the agenda. So I motion to do so. Is anyone opposed? Oh, it's been second. Do we need to vote on it? No, second. Okay. Is anyone opposed? Okay, so moved. Anything else about the agenda? Okay, the agenda is approved. Um, on to chair updates. Um, I have no update. You can do this. Uh, SACAD, Mike. Hello. Um, so a few updates from SACAD. The event that we currently had planned for Tuesday, um, I have canceled that. We're going to push that back till probably March um, and kind of give it some more thought. Um, so that is no longer an official event on our calendar. Um, secondly, what else uh, in SACAD? Um, we discussed Siggy's Hub today. Um, we are planning on having the um, assistant or deputy chief of activation into SACAB next week. We're going to discuss other event spaces in the Tivoli that student org specifically can use. Um, so that's our goal for that. Um, and then I think the last thing in SACAB we talked about was um, we're still rescheduling our bylaws uh, committee, but I'll let you all know when that does happen. So that's all I have from SACAB. Oh, you got Thank you, Mike. On to Mike with Budget Committee. Really need to like switch that up or something. Have some else to talk. Um, so, um, in terms of Budget Committee, um, we did not meet this week, um, but we are planning on meeting next week. Um, we're going to go over the budget as well as um, allocate some things to the office. So, um, you all have an invite to that, of course. So, um, that'll be a uh, better update next week. And should Paul just report on the BRC because that's like right underneath budget? All right, Paul, go ahead. Thank you. So I went to the BRC meeting today, spent two hours with a lot of our um, the institutional leaders here talking about um, essentially going over the data for enrollment and uh, retention rates essentially does not look good. We're in a dire situation when you compare the performance of our institution to our peers, uh, our peer institutions across the state. We are performing uh, probably the poorest out of the lot when it comes to retention, when it comes to enrollment. And so the big ask during this meeting was, here, let's see if I find it. Everyone at the university should be asking themselves how their role impacts retention, right? And so I really, you know, there are a lot of figures um, here, um, but to keep it to two minutes here, uh, I, I'll kind of just specify it looks like um, we're down 3.29% in credit hour production from uh, from last semester, it's my understanding. And um, it's my understanding as well that enrollment is down 1.4% uh, uh, or so. Um, and this was worse than the most pessimistic forecast they laid out. And so it really is a reason to kind of, you know, let's get our minds spinning on what we can do personally here to promote, um, you know, retention. And, uh, you know, personally, I've just, I'd throw out the, you know, student organizations, because one of the other fact points during the meeting was that, you know, here at Metro, like 10% to 11% of an, of an incoming class actually graduates and gets their degree. 30% drop out. There's staggering statistics. 
the thing that one of the things that impacts us the most in terms of like flipping that flipping the script is um, when students get involved in services like trio brother to brother uh, athletics programs student orgs and so it, it turns that like uh, those students have like an 81 percent retent like a uh, graduation rate as I understood it so um, that's everything I'll, I'll just end the report there thank you thank you Paul we're going to go on to Gabe now with the board of trustee update Awesome. Hi, everybody. Um, OK, so as you all saw, um, I see the put in the chat. Um, there was an article from CPR about uh, the Board of Trustees discussion um, on on faculty workload and all that stuff. And so I, and so I just wanted to give a little bit more clarity on the situation. That article omitted a lot of information that was already provided. Um, to the reporter beforehand. Uh, for example, uh, there was a statement from faculty leadership um, that was drafted uh, in, by the uh, faculty trustee um, and other elected uh, faculty leadership um, that was also gi uh, given to that reporter, but it was omitted completely from the story. Um, and, and there was also um, the faculty trustee sent out an email to the reporter as well um, because they were planning to interview her and ask her questions, but those questions were never sent to her, nor, uh, nor any com communication on what on, on what the faculty leadership had to say within this situation. Um, and so the article does not fully accurately reflect all of what's going on since it's omitting a lot of important parts. And I just really wanted to bring that up um, because I think it's, you know, it's an article and it had, and there's a lot of big statements within there. Um, and like I said, a lot of things were omitted. So take that article with a grain of salt. Um, and yeah, thank you. I don't thank you, Gabe. Um, moving on to sustainability committee, Taylor, Alex. I don't have an update. Do you, Alex? Uh, I don't have an update. Okay. Awesome. On to the Judiciary Committee with James. OK, the Judiciary Committee met uh, yesterday. We discussed a couple of things. The first thing I want to quickly discuss is SGTSAC received its first core request. Um, all I say is those involved in the request have compiled all the required and relevant documents into one file and have fulfilled the requests. If there are any further questions on this, I would ask you to direct them towards the Judiciary Committee or even our advisors. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is the district committee is issuing its first memo, and I will quickly go over what is in this memo, or I will read it off to you. On December 2nd, Alan Williams was found in violation of the MSU Denver Student Code of Conduct. Mr. Williams was stripped of his voting power until he completed a set of actions created by the Accountability Committee and approved by SGTSEC. These actions include written apologies to council members Taylor Lucas and Naomi, as well as attending GITA tra training sessions on microaggressions, decolonizing professionalism, and implicit bias. Mr. Williams was given until the end of February to complete these actions. The Accounting Committee de dictated that if in the event that Mr. Williams failed to meet these requirements, he would be removed from SGTSAC. This memo represents the beginning of, a three, of the three-week process of removal as stated in the TSAC handbook. Mr. Williams still has until the end of the month to meet his requirements, Therefore, I would like for the official vote of removal to take place on Friday, March 3rd, unless the requirements are met by the end of the month. If that be the case, then I, James Vargas, chair of the Judiciary Committee, will formally withdraw this memo and cease the removal process of Allen Williams. I encourage Mr. Williams to complete his required trainings and apologies and work with the council, not against it, to fully reinstate his voting power. And that is all that we discussed in the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, James. Um, on to Mike and then Dan. So this is a memo that's going out to Met Media, I'm assuming, or like just the general public, I'm assuming. It's as dictated by our handbook, we have to send out a memo to the council uh, to begin any process of removal. And that is just what this is. It can go out to Met Media if they request it. Uh, they will be public or available for public consumption. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Dan? James, that memo doesn't sound like this is a very shared governance structure. Just saying, just saying. Because it sounds like you kind of are like guarding power. Just just saying that out out there for that. I don't want to hear from you, Mike. 
Thank you, Dan. On to James. All I will say is this is how the removal process is dictated in the handbook. I am just simply fulfilling how we agreed to do it. Actually, Thomas Raglan, the dean, said that restorative justice generally starts with the lowest possible consequence first moving forward going up that way um so i'm just and that wasn't in the record the core request that i've requested either so not all of the documents were actually there in the request so i'm gonna have to make another one i guess i didn't get anything from you mike oh, um, okay oh wait, wait so let's go to stack um thank you dan thank you james mike you were next paul then me actually we'll talk about the core request later I uh, yield back my time. Okay. Paul? I just wanted to speak on the process. I believe it's been more than fair, more than inclined towards the spirit of restorative justice. The idea that a training, a racial sensitivity training or a decolonial training and an apology constitutes some sort of retributive, punitive act is to me ridiculous. And I want folks to understand this process of accountability has been going on since last semester. There's been thorough opportunity to give everybody involved voice so that nobody's being silenced. Nobody's not provided ample opportunity to defend themselves and to speak clearly on how their actions actually happened. Um, this process has been more than fair and that deserves to be outlined and everybody on this council deserves to have a voice. No one has had their voice taken from them. Naomi, then Alan, and then we're going to continue with the update since this is just a statement. You can comment on this after. Um, thank you. So just to like on your point of like going by the like lowest consequence possible and then moving up, I do believe that we've given him the opportunity like at minimum by now there could have at least been like a formal apology either through text or verbal like whatever. But like me personally, I haven't received that. So it's like we're trying to give him the benefit of the doubt here and we're also trying to um, go by the lowest consequence possible. And I mean, he's still in TSAC. We're still giving him that opportunity. He's he had plenty of time to do these. And um, hey, let's not interrupt people. He didn't get Let, paid this month. Let's let's not interrupt people while they're talking, because that's not how this goes. Thank you. But um, and let's not okay. interrupt people while they're talking. We are adults here. We can hold our tongues until someone finishes. Thank you. Now, I don't think that we're being absurd with the request that we're making here. So I think that we can follow through on what needs to be done and continue with this opportunity that we have presented to him. He is an adult. He is more than capable of reaching out to us if he needs extended time or if he just can't get into the time frame that works in his schedule. Thank you. Every time you talk to him, you attack him. Why would he want to come and apologize to you? OK, let's no. keep this professional. It is let's very professional. I'm saying this is a serious problem. He was voted in by the students and a group of people took his vote away. Point of order, we need to respect the rules of order. That we no, yes. well, I mean, let's continue. Alan is next, and then we're going to continue with the committee updates. We really don't have time for more conversation on this right now. Thank you. I would like permission from the chair to uh, read a quick statement. It won't take me longer than three minutes regarding this issue. Uh, I'll yield in my time then when it comes to roundtable updates. Okay, go ahead, Alan. Or part okay. of my time. Hello, my name is Alan Williams. I'd like to thank everyone for allowing me to speak. First, I want to praise this great institution, Metropolitan State University of Denver. I've learned, changed, and grown into an entirely new person while studying here, learning linguistics and philosophy. However, the most important learning how to communicate and think in powerful ways using the written and spoken word to great effect. I love this institution and all who are a part. I'm proud of MSU Denver and always will be. As an elected student counselor in our newly flattened governing structure at MSU, I am proud to represent the voice of others in an honest and frank manner. As history is often shown in any group of people, diversity is always our most valuable resource. This is why I must speak out against other members of this council who have not only violated the principle of flattened government, but have used the small amount of authority they have to create judiciary and accountability committees in order to discipline any member of this council who disagrees with the majority of this elected body. Fellow members have created a false disciplinary body completely outside of the control of the MSU Office of the Dean of Students in order to do harm to any members of this body who dare stand up in open and fair debate in this public arena. By creating these committees of judgment against other members, they have in effect created a kangaroo court using terms like restorative justice and quoting rules from the student code of conduct without proving what I've ever done wrong. 
As far as I can tell, all I've done wrong is use colorful linguistic metaphor I was taught at this school, not directed toward any individual in a chat box during our public meeting, also stating facts um, other members simply do not want to hear. <laughs> For my sins, other members of the council have created their kangaroo court and have not allowed me to vote since November. This violates not only the rights of fellow students who voted for me, it also violates my rights to academic freedom and my rights to freedom of speech guaranteed in the US Constitution. It is because of my love of knowledge, freedom of expression and the Constitution and my love of fellow students at MSU, I have made a formal request to the MSU Office of the Dean of Students to intervene in our governing body and implement true restorative justice through a real and true third party. No group of students should be allowed to create a governing or power structure in order to do harm to any person on this campus simply because their opinion stands in opposition to their own. Simply put, speaking truth to power. I am asking that all committees which create a power structure be immediately disbanded. Also that the council immediately and once again recognizes me as a full voting member of the council while we give the MSU Dean of Students a chance in time to implement true restorative justice. Not a small group of angry students who are falsely claiming to represent the restorative justice process all while working secretly in back rooms without any due process, completely outside the jurisdiction of the MSU Dean of Students. Anything less than honoring my simple, fair, and reasonable request is a black eye against the diversity of this body, the student body, and does a great disservice to the diversity of this great institution. If you want to prove that a flattening governing structure truly works, then it's time to stop creating power structures which demand fellow elected members answer to a small number of bullies on this council. I refuse to participate in your kangaroo court, choosing instead to surrender myself to the mercy of the Office of the Dean of Students in true restorative justice as administered by a truly neutral third party that exists in order to protect our student rights in a fair and impartial manner. I will not resign and again demand immediately the MSU Student Council restore my full power to vote as a representative who is elected by students at this institution. I've been called a hater, a bigot, and accused of being on stolen land multiple times by fellow student council members all while facing unwarranted persecution by a group which is administering discipline outside the authority of the Office of the Dean of Students. I have also been recently accused by fellow members of this council of not participating or advocating for my fellow students at this university. As a registered libertarian, I need not apologize to any member of this council that thinks the creation of more bureaucracy is the definition of doing one's job as elected to do. I believe in less government. I have a fundamental right to my belief in libertarianism and therefore to also choose to participate or not participate in government any way I see fit without harassment by other members of this body. Furthermore, I also believe the student body at this institution needs to know the names of any member who voted for participating or participated on these kangaroo courts and is fighting against the very diversity that is our greatest strength. Media is free to obtain their names from me. Thank you for your time and that is all. Thank you, Alan. On to the PR committee, James. I'd like to make a motion. I'll second it. Well, I, well, I, I'll Specifically, I, I think okay. it would be fair if we open this up to discussion and table roundtable updates until the uh, maybe a 15 minute duration of discussion has, has, has ended. I simply I think second. it's unfair to open up the floor to a single member for three minutes and then tell everybody else they can respond. I second that. OK, it looks like we'll go into voting. Um, Paul, can you clarify the motion? So this would be to continue discussion for another 15 minutes on what Alan just said. OK. No, he's, it's, it's been second. We I need to vote it. on this. OK, can you call the names and I'll say yes or no. Okay. Uh, Dan? Yes. Alex? Or abstain. <laughs> Re? Alan. No. James? No. Uh, Mike? No. Gabe? No. Taylor? No. Naomi? No. Wait, did everybody? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Oh, Paul. Yeah, we, we should have continued discussing this. Okay. I agree. I agree with that for sure. But we have our round table. We have our little updates. We can. Nobody asked me what I think. Uh, the motion has failed. 
Thank you. On to the PR committee updates. Uh, the PR committee has not meet, uh, met. We will meet next week. Thank you. On to the SAB updates. Um, me and James met with the Early Learning Center today. Um, Roy with Student Org things. Um, what were the other two? James, can you help me out? Yeah, so we heard from the music department, um, learning about all their kind of stuff, uh, Gita and their impact on the students here, and as well as the Childhood Early Development, our Learning Center. And they all asked for a minor increase. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, now on to the Policy Advisor Committee, Reed. Mike and I had talked to Megan Jones, who's um, the administrator for the university, about the uh, possibility that we could meet with Megan Conklin to come up with a potential new policy to redirect unused scholarship money to support students in another way. And Megan has come back to us and saying that because there's a new chief financial officer, she's looking at the um, budget policy right now, and we're going to hopefully have a meeting really soon about this. Just wanted to report that. Thank you. Uh, moving on to faculty student affairs, Re. I want to say I hope everybody had the chance to look in the OneDrive at that faculty handbook and make comment. I'll, if you can look, if you haven't yet, please look through that and make any kind of commentary that you, you can before I give that back to her. That's all I have for that. Mike, you wanted to add something? Yeah, so um, I, I've been in talks with the VP of the Faculty Senate, um, and um, there's a lot of drama going on in the Faculty Senate currently, um, but we have been asked um, to write a resolution supporting the faculty uh, during this hard time, so my goal was to have someone come in, come in here and kind of explain to us, and then uh, we vote in, uh, in uh, support to their cause for a, th a reduction in workload. That's what the main kind of cause for it is. So that is what they've asked of us. Um, I'll have more updates, um, and anyone's free to join on that process as well. So thank you. Thank you. On to the Indigenous Student Resource Committee. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Also, Mike, to second off that, I had a couple, uh, a student come to me, not a couple, I had a students and a faculty member also come to me as well with some information. Um, I've started up a document, a document to get the um, entire list of tenures here at MSU Denver. I've gotten through the art department, so that's going great. Um, and then I'm going to get a mock-up email because I feel like we should definitely collaborate with them. Um, and I've been working a little bit with Paul on this as well. This literally, I just started this today, so that's why I was bringing to the table today. So if we have any ways of collaborating on this, like I just got started, so whatever you guys bring to the table, I'd really appreciate the collaboration. I just want to make sure we evolve um, the student that came to me and then also all the tenure professors because this is potentially, this is on them, you know, um, we want to support them in that. So yeah, um, another thing the Indigenous Resource Committee got started on, um, we're working on a couple different resolutions, one for, um, you know, something to get like a, a space for Native and Indigenous students to feel heard and seen and present on campus, um, and then also um, a BIPOC slash um, Indigenous uh, student engagement incentive kind of package thing we're looking at without being too, um, without having like a big event, like something that could be more consistent and sustainable uh, that I also spoke with um, Mike as well, um, budget wise. So we haven't come up with a definitive price range package yet though. Um, and then we also have a presentation that we will be showing you guys for student engagement that we'd like to take to individual professors um, and classes all around campus um, to kind of show them what we're about here as the Indigenous Resource Committee and TSAC um, to have them, you know, be able to feel more comfortable coming and engaging with us with their needs and just see what we can fulfill for them as, you know, student government and the Indigenous Resource Committee. Um, Dan, Paul, Alex, do you guys have anything else? You guys are very collaborative on all these events and I greatly appreciate your efforts and I want your voices to be heard as well. I have no updates. None from me either. Same. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Naomi. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Um, on to the open floor announcements. We're going to do that for a few minutes, and then we have our advisor updates until three. Any open floor updates? Re, Paul. Just to say that the student travel committee is humming with applications and conferences, professional development for students. And just to remind you in your networks to please, you know, 
find things that you can be involved in that this this organization can fund and and it's all in the name of MSU Denver but for your own professional development so take advantage of it thank you Ree Paul then Dan I just want to quickly reiterate the the call for community building and maybe throw out an idea that I've talked to a few counselors about um, you know it would be cool if each counselor um, took under their wing or maybe took under uh, their workload the idea of helping a student work on campus whether that's help them use apply for and use funding in CMEI whether that's helping them find a space like in our office where they can work in the interim while we fight for a better space for them in Tivoli um, if that's being their fourth officer so that they can actually get registered and, and begin all the other processes we just talked about um, I think that'd be a really good way for all of us to like very directly help uh, build that kind of community on campus I would encourage it not just be our own clubs. I know we got a lot of clubs here, you know, and so I'm going to reach out in the two clubs I'm looking at right now for this. I encourage everyone to kind of do the same. I'm looking at the Auraria Cross uh, Disability Alliance, and the Black Student Alliance. Who I've been talking with President Maya and Tep about, uh, you know, their difficulties finding space, an office space. Um, and I said that, you know, in the interim, Come do some work in our office while we, again, fight for that actual dedicated student org space in Tivoli, which never should have been taken from the students in the first place, right? And so another reminder, Sigi's Hub, everyone, taken from us with no oversight. Thank you, Paul. On to Dan. Yeah, so um, I have two things, but first up, so I don't know if there's not much the council can do, but um, currently in order to receive the emergency funding in the care center, you have to be at least six credits. Um, or on SNAP benefits to receive another funding. And so I personally am going through a deal where I absolutely am in dire need of that and can't receive that um, because of the, you know, the emergencies going on. Um, so I don't know if there's anything we can do to write a res resolution to push for them to lower that threshold or, you know, I'm, I'm also waiting on a job in the Dean of Students office potentially to go through um, the restorative justice people. I know the workday um, implementation was a disaster. Um, so yeah, yeah. So basically, I think we should do something about that because I mean, I was I mean, I'm a 4.0 student taking 15 credits all the way through. And then now this because of taking care of my mother had to drop down and now I can't get the money when I when I need it. Um, and then secondly, I want to remind everybody um, and bear with me here. Um, Will Simpkins on our inauguration day talking about um, how we're going to be the model going forward for flat and structured governments around the country. And with that, I think we should adhere and really think hard about what Alan was saying about having the school intervene in conduct rather than a few people who fought for the chairs to not even have announcements originally and now come chair these committees to kick people off. Um, so just wanted to um, bring that up. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you, Dan. On to Alan. Yeah, I've been lobbying for a a space for a club uh, that has been it's been for two or three years I've been trying to get this space I've been told no a lot uh, the club is monsters and monstrosities club this is kind of piggybacking on what uh, Paul was saying about uh, getting involved in us doing lobbying for for student organizations but anyway this last week it finally came through and uh, I think it's a it just shows that if you keep trying a lot of times if you just keep uh, trying to ask for things eventually if you ask the right person in the right ask way you can do a lot of good just by uh, advocating for clubs i'm going to help them start their club write their constitution but i'm not going to be a member because i'm busy this senior year but um i just want to let you guys know that you know it, it, when you keep advocating it works and uh all of us can do our part in our own way um without having to answer to other individuals on the committee about what we're doing to lobby for the students because we can all do good in our own way without answering to each other and I agree with what um, Dan is saying. We need to get rid of these, any kind of disciplinary committee out of our process, rewrite our constitution so that all disciplines handled through the Office of the Dean of Students. It's the only right thing to do. I would just like to piggyback off, piggyback off that and just be, um, also say that, yes, I agree that like you can do your own work in your own ways around here as well. Um, and that you can truly like get anything you want out of this university. Like I've been through all the loops and jumps and holes and loopholes and it's just a really truly amazing thing that you can get um, the funding that you need you can get the resources that you need it just takes not accepting no as an answer sometimes and finding a different way to go about things but there is a way to provide for people 
Okay, and on that note, we're going to go into public comment and then we'll do our advisor updates right after that. Is there anyone from the a public member who wants to give an up comment? Looks Hi, John. Like Hello, everybody. My name is John Nelson, and I'm a student here at the Metropolitan State University. And I came here because this is Black History Month. And by this being Black History Month, and I being a colored man myself, I am a natural born leader. And being a natural born leader, I like to set an example. I like to set an example of what healthy is like, living a healthier lifestyle, exercising, in addition to going to school. And so I came here to put forth a request to get assistance on the complete payment of a hybrid bike. I would use that hybrid bike. Um, to get around the city for transportation, and it'll also keep my footprint off the environment, and it will allow me to build my stamina, being healthy, so that when I am reading books, on the computer, taking emails, I'm not falling asleep. So I plan on getting a degree. However, I'm not going to get a degree being fat and unhealthy. It is very important that health is first, Yes, education is important, but without health, there is no education. And I found that I have a very strong spiritual practice, so I'm able to get myself in the vibration of being really positive. I have been a beacon of hope for various students at the school, and so I have a couple of health issues that I'm moving through. I don't say the word dealing with, I say healing with. So I came here to put forth the request to get some assistance to purchase a hybrid bike. And you all have to tell me the process. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Um, is there anyone else who would like to give a update? John, have you, uh, are you aware of the uh, city, uh, the city's program to give free bikes away? Uh, if you are, yeah. I, would, I can forward okay. you the information. So. I was told about the uh, Denver voucher program. They're starting and I put a, it was on June, June, January the 30th. I put a message on my phone to activate five minutes before 11 o'clock, because that's when you go for the bidding. At 10.55, the server wasn't working. I kept going and going and going, and I wasn't able to get in. So that told me by divine order, this wasn't for me to do. So still keeping the vibration of knowing that I'm going to be blessed, I end up rendezvousing with you all, but I did my due diligence to this point. I've exhausted all those avenues. At this point, I'm looking for the assistance to get this by. If you got any questions for me, Thor? Okay. Um, Chad, did you have an update? Yes. I'd say save for later. He has his own slot yeah. after the advisor update. You have your own slot now. Okay. Is that it for updates? Can I do that? Dan? And so I just want to say that I was going to help John out with the bike, and there's been. Um, He's come to request a few things and I was able to help him in, in some manner. And so I had planned on doing it personally, um, but because of my mother, I wasn't able to. So I'm really glad that John did. And I would like us to support him if he could come up with. If John could come up with a, like the, the bike that he wants and, and, and something that's reasonable and like we had talked about, John, he could come up with that. You know, I think that I, I think it would be worth motioning to, for us to um, pass you along the money. Or, or get the bike, I mean, in some way, you know, to go along with that uh, instant pot. His contact information. Right? All right. Give it to you. Okay, me then, Paul. Um, I also want to say about the bike, I think it is wonderful. Um, I want to look into the logistics of this because I know in the past, um, we're not supposed to give out scholarships. Can the advisors maybe speak on that? Um, so in the previous uh, student government structure that was actually um, codified that we were, you all as an entity are not um, able to provide personal scholarships. 
and personal um, to students or, or support in that way. And so now in the new structure, I think that is something we definitely need to revisit. And it's probably with our um, executive director of financial aid, Carleen Uglas, and um, our foundation to see what the, because there may be parameters around that. So. Okay, thank you. On the Paul, oh, sorry. Paul, Naomi, Naomi, first time, Paul. Um, just point of clarification. So does that mean like we also can't do like Visa gift cards kind of situation either? It, yeah. Right. <clears throat> I think due to the, the structure of, you know, the state and federal funding, if it's for, I don't want to say that word, if it's for a game of chance or if it's for giveaway items and things like that, I think we can do gift cards. Um, but if it's for one sole purpose, for one sole person, I do not yeah. believe that qualifies. Yeah. Okay, so like yeah. if we were to do something like this, it would have to be like multiple gift cards of the same value going out to different people kind of situation, like, a, like yeah. a raffle situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. With, like a drawing. Yeah, and essentially it would have to be either a drawing or if you all, depending on what the parameters are, develop some kind of emergency or care fund, potentially. Mm -hmm that may be the parameters, but that's legality issues we all had to look into. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, on to Paul, then Dan. Uh, so then I want to definitely direct us to think about this as a less of a um, if we can and more of a how, like how are we going to make this happen? And I, I, I stand with Taylor and with Dan and with the others who have talked about this being a good idea. And I think we really, really, really should think about how this ain't just a, this isn't a giveaway. We're not looking at helping one person. This is an investment in our community. Like we, and, we, and I'm not just using those words, like the amount of people that John interacts with on the day to day in a very positive way impacts people, right? And when we talk about like having better practices, ethically, sustainably, anything like that in our commutes and our health practices, the best way is to set an example for other people, right? And what better example than a shining leader in our, in our, in our school here, right? And so I am really excited about this because we can do this, see if it works, which I'm confident it will, and we should do it again and again and again. And I don't see why we wouldn't necessarily be able to budget this out for like 10 student leaders. And if we got one student leader doing this, making this kind of impact, right, making cycling a more popular thing in our community, more than it already is, um, who's to say what, you know, eight or 10 people doing the same thing would be. And while that looks like a small thing, we ought to think bigger in, in, in terms of like the cascading effect that it will have. And so um, this seems to me a small price for what could be a large effect that we can have on the campus. So that's it. Okay, Dan, then John. And then an alternative could be, um, since we do get paid for student fees, I mean, if we each put 50 bucks towards it, if they're not gonna allow us to do a scholarship, that would be 600. I don't know if he could get one for that. That's just a suggestion. Um, because I know when I gave him the instant pot, he was so grateful and brought, you know, and just, you know, really made use of it and and, and said he was going to pass it along to the uh, forward. So um, I definitely think we should really, really figure out a way, like Paul said, not if, but how are we going to be able to do this? On to John. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I was listening to you all talk too. I don't mind being a template for excellence. Some of the, uh, the thought process came to me <laughs> that it's all about the language, how you phrase things. So what about if I was willing to donate some of my time to a particular service or what have you? There's a, so no just means to me, no means to invert the N and the O, turn it on. So I heard about ways that we not work at it, Let's flip it to ways that we can work it. And so I want to keep that idea flowing with you all. Okay. And thank you. Okay. I think we should have a couple people go and look into how to make this work. So, and then we can move, move on with our meeting. So who, are there any volunteers? Paul, Naomi, yep. can you two take this on? Alex too? Okay. Oh, Alan too. Cool. Um, is anyone opposed to those four of them doing it? Awesome. I have a yes, Paul. 
my engagement with this is under the stipulation if we work as a group everyone's co everyone's contributing to the effort mm -hmm. okay great um okay is there any other public comments wonderful i motion that we adjourn early from public comment second is anyone opposed so moved it, on to the advisor updates Hello everyone. Happy Friday. Um, what uh, what is my update? Yes. So we finally have Chad onboarded. Woo! Thank you, Workday. Yes. Welcome, Chad. As our elections manager, we are still in the process of hiring one more. Um, for continuity purposes, I do have one person who applied. So hopefully, we can process that through HR and Workday in a timely manner. Um, big thank you to HR, Student Employment, and Workday. If you ever see them, just give them a solid. Thank you and a high five because they do a lot for y'all behind the scenes. Um, one of the things that we were talking about earlier is that um, the payment stipend has been a little bit of a, a quirk now that you all receive leadership stipends, not scholarships and not jobs. So the way that Workday, Workday doesn't understand that and doesn't have an option for that. So we've been trying to figure out how to finesse. Mm -hmm. So give us grace, give us patience, give HR grace and patience, most importantly um working through that um yeah that's bro yeah um and to that to that end i just want to reiterate that um we did work quite a bit last week to try to sort out the leadership stipend so thank you for your patience and your grace with us um i did not hear back from anyone yet um except for one person around the leadership stipend um not potentially being deposited into their account if there is an issue um, please let me know. Um, I'm working diligently daily with HR and accounting to make sure people are getting paid, not just students, professional staff too. So know that um, it has been rough um, with the transition and that's no excuse, but I, I will continue to advocate and keep um, spending time to figure out how we, we make that work. Um, in addition to that, um, I also wanted to give an update. Um, many of you reached out on, uh, what was that, Monday, Tuesday? I don't even know, Monday. This week has been a long week. Um, around the bomb threat in the Lynx Crossing um, building and just wanted to give you all an update um, in that regard that um, ACPD is no longer involved in that investigation. It's an ongoing investigation that the Denver Police Department has now taken over. Um, and we there is not an ongoing threat um, at this point in time, um, our student care center did reach out to all of the residents um, within Lynx Crossing. We have 174 students um, who are housed there. And so we did offer additional support and resources to those students. Um, and uh, yeah, just wanted to provide an update there because I know a lot of you were, um, as many people were freaked out about that. Um, and so just wanted to, to give you that update. I also wanted to share, um, I don't know how many of you received the early bird, um, and we've been talking a lot here about the faculty workload and um, the challenges and the um, just, uh, there's there are a lot of emotions around that and um, our faculty, our faculty senate and your, um, our, our senior leadership are working through that with the board of trustees, um, but just know that our provost um, Dr. Alfred Tatum um, officially is going to be stepping down um, from his role as provost and um, Dr. Marie Mora will be stepping into that role as of March 15th. And so I wanted to offer that. They have both been here to meet with you all and to talk to you all about the initiatives um, and the things that they are doing in the provost office um, for faculty and in partnership with you all. And so just wanted you all to know um, that that leadership shift will be taking place. Um, the other thing I wanted to offer since we've been talking a lot about it is around the accountability slash judiciary um, committee and letting you all know that the Dean of Students Office is heavily involved in that um, from various different perspectives and um, Thomas uh, Raglund met with the group last week and he is out on vacation this week. 
um, but we'll be here next week and him and I will connect on Monday um, to revisit that and um, help to better support and guide um, your process. But I want to remind you all that we just need to make sure that whatever is happening is in alignment um, with the current policies of the university um, and Thomas's guidance in that respect will be really important. Um, so just wanted to, to offer that. I also want to welcome Taylor Tuckett, Tackett, sorry, um, who is here with us today, who's my new boss um, and who's the AVP Dean of Students. Um, so excited to have Taylor on board. We've had an eventful week um, <laughs> over the past three days. I will be stepping down um, and back into my role I already have as the Associate Dean for Equity and Student Engagement. And so um, transitioning out of that, but for right now, we'll continue to be here to support as the co-advisor to TSAC. Um, but yeah, stepping back to my role. And anything else? Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, advisors. Um, we're going to go to Abigail Kell on housing. Um, Paul, we're going to have to do your resolution after our speakers, OK? What would election managers do? Here and do it. Thank you, everyone. My name is Abby Kell. Y'all can call me Abby. I am the Student Housing Project Manager for MSU. Hello, everyone. My name is Mo Lotif. Uh, I'm a new member to the community working in the strategy office. Uh, I'll be the Director of Infrastructure Development moving forward. Coincidentally, this is my one month anniversary here. I think for you too, right? Yeah, we started January 10th. So we're excited to be here with you all and to kind of give you an overview of where things are with housing. I know your interests were on affordable housing specifically, uh, particularly for students with dependents and families and also for pets. So we'll speak a bit to that with that. Um, just to kind of frame our conversation today, I uh, want to start off with Impact 2030, our strategic plan, which I'm sure you all here are familiar with. The reason I bring this up, because this is an anchoring document um, in that it guides the rest of the university and the units within them that serve our students and our faculty and our staff in terms of how we allocate our priorities and our resources. So I want to highlight two things that we'll speak to concretely. Pillar one of that plan, which is student access, service and achievement, particularly goal one. Students are centered in goal one, pillar one of this plan. So to attract, prepare and graduate students to succeed. Part of that is this housing component. And I know in the student affairs strategic plan, um, they have a concrete goal that student affairs as a unit will reduce or eliminate, el eliminate uh, student housing insecurity at MSU Denver. And Abby will speak to some of the resources today on that. And then I'll briefly touch on pillar five, um, which is really about the built environment, particularly when it comes to thinking about ways to enrich the student experience. One of those avenues is the affordable uh, campus housing options for students. Um, that's proximal to the to to this place. I'll speak a bit to that. With that, I'll turn it over to Abby. Thank you. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to talk about just is the current offerings that MSU currently is able to offer to students right now. Um, and then just also know that with our students in housing, it is definitely a spectrum. It is a wide range of what different students need and have. And part of my role is to really help navigate that and try to help find it. Um, so some of the current offerings we have, which we already discussed today, is the Care Center and some of the things the Care Center can offer. We have the Emergency Fund, which was already brought up here today. It is a $1,000 cash allotment to students that are going through an emergency, and that was granted once a semester. Um, and the Care Center, as you know, is really a catch-all for all things that are going through. Um, the next thing they can offer is resource navigation, which is particularly important for our students with dependents, because typically our students with dependents may need and qualify for certain services, such as SNAP, CCAP, TANF, and other, those other things. Uh, the Care Center is a great tool to be able to navigate those and understand the bureaucracy of them, because there's a lot of documents, there's a lot of applications, and they can be really confusing and overwhelmed for our students. Um, and then, of course, we also support our students experiencing homelessness through the emergency fund, but also additional ways of transitional housing, 
students may be interested in, in, in shelters or something in the, around that realm, or trying to find something that will fit their needs um, to help accommodate them. And then the next current offering is my role, my whole role. I was hired here about in April to really help students try to navigate that student experience when it comes to finding housing. Kind of like what I alluded to in the beginning, um, every student is going to come here with a different needs and students are a spectrum from traditional student to our students with dependents to our students who are only going to be here a short time um, for whatever reason that it means. So I really have to help navigate those students and help meet them where they're at to find the best option for them. I help students with budgeting. So I see what their budget is for rent. If we need to go through financial aid to help get more, if we need to go through scholarships, I meet them with their resource navigation, a lot of what the care center has. Some students do qualify for affordable housing or low income tax credit housing projects. I can help understand their situation to see if they do qualify or don't qualify. Um, and then some of our students have never applied to an apartment before, um, or some of our students have fears and hesitation about applying to apartments due to being denied in the past. I have worked in affordable housing um, for over five years now. I worked with housing choice vouchers prior to this role, so I really understand the application process and can help give them options that are going to lead them to success. W matching them with landlords I've worked before in the past that may work with backgrounds, with credits, or evictions, I really try to help make that student experience personal to them so that they're not just getting a hodgepodge of options that we already have. I really try to cater to that because as especially with being a parent and I'm a parent myself, I know the struggle it is to find housing and to find housing that's going to be comfortable for your dependents as well. Because if our dependents aren't safe, then we don't feel safe and the student, student experience will be there. And that student will be successful. So I really try to meet with them where they're at and I really try to provide that empathy that this is hard. Denver is tough. It is expensive. Um, and I try to give them the best options they can to figure it out. But we do have some things in motion to hopefully help make this a little bit better. Um, one thing I'm particularly really excited about is we just signed an MOU with Denver Housing Authority. Um, and with that partnership will come housing choice vouchers in the form of rental assistance. And that is a really exciting opportunity for our student. And with that partnership, we'll hopefully be able to gain more areas to be connected with DHA. And DHA can also help us with our affordable housing quest. Um, another area that we're also working in is marketing. I know that website is terrible. <laughs> I'm working to make that website a lot more user friendly, but also a lot more accommodating to the varying types of students so that students from different backgrounds can be able to navigate what's going to be what's going to be best for them. Another thing that's on my plate that should be coming hopefully this April and May is homeownership classes. I'm hoping to host those in the Tivoli this, uh, this late spring. Homeownership does not happen overnight. It takes years to prepare for it. And so I'm hoping to host those so that students may be interested so they can see the course that they need to do in order to own a home one day. Um, and then the last thing is also policy updates and making sure that the students know and are educated on those so that they have tools in their pocket when they're going to landlords and apartments. In 2020, the General Assembly passed the Source of Income Bill, which does not, which allows landlords to not discriminate based on the income that they receive, meaning your financial aid, your scholarships qualify as income, which, should, which will help alleviate the barrier of applying to apartments. Previously, that wasn't the situation. And so now this is a new policy moving forward and helping students understand that this is something they can have in their toolkit or in their tool belt. And then if they're still struggling, they can come to me and I can help advocate as well and also speak to landlords. Thank you, Abby. Awesome work you all are doing. And so to add to that, a thing in motion um, with regards to uh, affordable student housing options on campus, um, this is a big goal for our strategy branch and certainly a key part of my job. And so right now we have a lot of things, you know, cooking. Um, and as we're going into really making these plans material, there are a few things that I want to highlight for you that we're trying to bake into the project. So one, I'm going to touch on the program goals. And what I mean by program goals is when we build this physical infrastructure, what are we trying to achieve with it? So this frames our discussions with potential partners, whether they're private developers, whether they're philanthropists, or whether we're working when, on the public side with the government to secure funding for these projects. So one, to offer below market rate units. Now to get to that, it's a complex process, but we have some tools. Uh, notably, Proposition 123, which we just went into effect in January of 2023, what it basically allows is um, appropriations from the state to either get uh, you know, um, debt that is at an interest rate that's better than what the market offers or to get an investment from uh, the public sector to subsidize your development. 
what does that mean when it comes to the end user, i.e. our tenants, in this case, our students, we're able to you know, achieve a below market rate. It's still being institutionalized. There has to be a process set in place for us to access those funds, but that's one of the tools that are available to us to use to deliver on that programmatic goal. So that's one of the things that our office is working um, quite uh, insistently on, along with you know, Abby's team um, as we advance these plans. The other thing, I know family and pet-friendly operations and policies, that's been a huge issue with our existing housing options from what I understand. So as we move forward with these plans, really putting that on the forefront, once we build these projects, how are we operating them and putting in the foreground this programmatic goal in particular, since you all have raised it as a significant issue. This other thing, you know, really looking at the feasibility of on-site dining options. I know some folks like to cook, but for other folks, you know, having food on site might make it more feasible when you're thinking about food insecurity and also just, you know, cost savings on groceries because that inflation is also driving that up. So incorporating that into our planning of the physical infrastructure is key. Um, again, so keeping the end in mind, ultimately, why are we doing all of this? Well, we frame it in terms of the student experience. One, providing you all housing that is affordable, i.e. below market rate. Two, if we're doing this project, these projects on campus, the proximity to classes and campus amenities is huge. It cuts down on your transit time. It also gets into that third bullet, which I think is critical for students, regardless of what your background is, or wanting to stay at a place. And that's that sense of longing and a sense of connection to place and the opportunity to build that community. I think affordable housing units on campus really gets to that, which is critical to retention, which is critical to just a great experience overall. And then lastly, you know, when we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, shelter and housing is a fundamental need. And meeting that is the precursor to like really having a rich college experience. So we think that, you know, we know actually that these projects would um, get at these. So that's kind of where we're at. Again, I've been a month in. Um, our chief strategy officer has been here for about five months. And this has been, you know, on our forefront each and every day. So with that, if you all have any questions, we're yes, we have five minutes for questions. I just wanted to say um, I was a part of a, a focus group like last semester that was going around questions like this. And that is just amazing to see how serious you guys took this situation and are turning it around. And I got to be a part of like the first feasibility meeting for this. And I saw a lot of like just progressive thinking. And it is just makes me feel really proud to be a, an MSU student to see that you take things like this very serious and then also put in the action that goes forward with it. So I just want to say thank you all and your team for really like pushing forward on all of this and thinking about, you know, uh, that I, the diversity that's going to be coming to these housing projects. So thank you. Thank you. On to Alan, then Paul. Hello. Uh, thank you both for coming in here. Uh, it's really meaningful to me what you're doing. I mean, um, if it wasn't for the student care center, I wouldn't be at school right now. So it's a big deal. The question I have is, I guess, for Abby, when you were talking about the um, the uh, housing choice vouchers, does that mean that students that are on Section 8 are going to be able to bypass the, the, the lottery that they have, DHA, to, to get Section 8? Um, so just a couple like terminology pieces there, I think might help you understand it. So formally, Section 8, that's really not the language we use anymore. Um, it's OK. So like that's again, it's a shift from different language. So what is commonly card now to is called project based. So that is a building that is specifically allocated to uh, an authority like Denver Housing Authority or Aurora Housing Authority. They own that building and then they're able to provide rental assistance to the lottery system that people are filtered through. Housing choice vouchers come through different housing authorities as well as different agencies, and those don't go by the um, wait list anymore or lottery systems anymore. You actually have to go through the process, what's called the VI SPDAT, which is a long application process. Not really application, I really shouldn't say, but it's a survey that goes based off need. Um, and then once you go through the need, it gives you a number qualifier and then it assigns you to a certain housing choice voucher that would fit best within your range. Like, for example, there's housing choice vouchers for young adults who were in juvenile justice or for young adults who are in the foster care system or there's specific housing choice vouchers for addictions and 
around those areas to help support because typically those housing choice vouchers come with other types of services with them as well. So they may come with counselors, they may come with other types of coaches that help them with job trainings. And so those are kind of two different things. So we're getting housing choice vouchers. Denver Housing Authority at the end of the day will have the authority to decide what students receive those housing choice vouchers. There will be an application process. There will be a process that students have to go through and we're still learning what that's going to look like. Okay, so the time frame is kind of still up in the air a little bit, but it's. I good. would expect it to start 24, fall 2024. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Right on. Thank you, uh, Dan, on to Paul, and then Armando. Oh, okay, never mind. Just Paul. <laughs> All right, uh, mine's just a quick question. Um, props, by the way, for a good delivery. I thought you matched uh, what we were talking about and stuff really well. You know, you know your crowd. <laughs> um, but my question would be have you all, um, have, have they, narrow down a particular like provider for the in-house dining? Like we're we looking at like Aramark or anything like that? Or? Great question. Mm -hmm. No, cool. no, we have not because no. And when you say in-house, you mean like um, within um, like a, a housing facility? Is that what you're referring I, to? I guess I'm, I'm more referring to companies like Sodexo or Aramark that provide like uh -huh. the, you know, the under basis for like the School of Mines uses Sodexo. I know uh -huh. Aramark's pretty popular yeah. for a lot of schools. Just wanted to know if it was either of those that you all were looking at. No. I want to discourage looking at those. Yeah, sure. They sure. Have no, the, horrible no, the, ethical practices. Yeah. So, no, there has been no contemplation of that. Cool. We're not there yet. Cool, cool. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. Due to the schedule, we do have to move on. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming through today. We appreciate you. Um, next on the agenda is Matthew, um, who is our guest speaker for advocacy on Medicaid. I also, give you the floor. I also put our housing friends, their emails in our chat. So you, if you have Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. I think it just went through. I put a copy of a flyer I created for my organization as well. I hit send, but I don't see it yet. Well, it looks like going through. OK, you have 15 minutes. All right. I just went a little bit since I've used a PowerPoint. <laughs> Um, so thank you everybody for having me here today. Um, my name is Matthew Rathbun. I'm a master of social work student here at MSU Denver. Um, I'm doing my internship with an organization called Combined Beaver Health. Um, and Combined is a 501c4 uh, nonprofit trade association. It's a organization of individual providers. Oh, sorry. It's an independent provider network of Medicaid mental health professionals advocating for policy and legislative change um, at various levels up to the state legislature. Um, their vision is a psychological healthy Medicaid member served by diverse, competent, and sustainable behavioral healthcare workforce, which I feel definitely follows a lot of the um, like vision and mission of MSU Denver, especially hitting those, making sure we're hitting a lot of diverse populations and having appropriate uh, representation. Um, their mission is, um, wait, did I, oh, my big, psychological healthy Medicaid members served by diverse, competent, and sustainable behavioral health care workforce. Um, again, their values are dignity, respect, and care for Medicaid members and the providers who serve them. Um, a diverse component of sustainable Medicaid behavioral health care workforce and understanding and mitigating historical and current impacts of stigma, discrimination, and oppression in behavioral health care. Um, so part of how we do that is we have a number of different committees. I don't know if it's falling on, there it is. Um, for instance, Yakita is our BIPOC committee chair. Um, so we want to bring um, the BIPOC committee into the conversation. Um, we have a legislative committee who's actually run by my site supervisor. Um, we have uh, committees with like CCHA, which is a RAE or like regional accountable entity, which covers behavioral health care in Colorado. 
Um, and then I actually came on in an interesting position um, because everyone else is like directors of um, like mental health collaboratives or individual therapists. And I'm coming in actually as the Medicaid member committee chair. So my job is actually to organize Medicaid members into both the organization and to the advocacy to make sure that bring them into the table and establish them as stakeholders in the conversations around Medicaid and their rights. Um, so the mission for my committee is the mission uh, is to educate Medicaid members about their rights to mental health care in Colorado and to amplify their stories and voices into meaningful policy change by empowering members to engage in advocacy by sharing our experiences with state representatives. And again, I'm still following the um, values of the org as a whole of trying to make sure it's diverse, make sure I'm getting stories of multiple identities and trying to bring everybody to the table who wants to share their voice. Um, so I have three different opportunities on how um, Medicaid members, well actually I have four, I have three that go on my flyer that I posted in the chat, which are these. Um, I do passive education opportunities, so I have a Facebook page that I post um, and share a lot of different resources on educating Medicaid members on how to about their rights and how to share their stories and um, information and along those lines about policy and legislation news. Um, I have a membership group, which is more of an active discussion and conversation around a lot of the similar content. Um, and then I will also be working with Medicaid members to actually coach them to testify to the state legislature, depending legislature, depending on what bills are brought up and like if they're contentious and if they need that extra voice and also just generally encouraging those members to be a part of the process and share their stories, even if it's not with the org. Um, and then the piece that I don't have on here is I'm actually creating my own Medicaid member committee. So also looking for individuals who actually want to join in like the organizing piece and bringing other voices to the table. Um, and so some of the types of legislation we're following currently, and again, we will fine tune based on what legislation needs the assistance, if it's just gonna pass easily or kind of how the process goes. Um, but some that are semi-relevant to kind of our student population, um, SB 23091 concerns access to BBR healthcare services for Medicaid recipients who experience risk factors and health fluence. This is actually to expand some of it to those who are under 21, um, which a lot of our population here of college students is in that range that might be in a gap of insurance where they're not actually covered, um, especially if they're part time, because um, if they're full time, we definitely have our school's insurance as well, but this would maybe help them save that money. Um, then other policy legislations around concerning prior authorization or what's known as step therapy, which is where you have to try and fail at lower level therapies to get better access to care. Um, and then other programs about um, expanding um, coverage of mental health services. So this is slightly outside of Medicaid, um, but to expand the number of sessions veterans can get for mental health care. Um, so even though it's we advocate both in mental health and Medicaid specifically. Um, and then another one that concerns like my population within my program and my peers is there's a bill out um, pertaining to the hour requirements and licensure for mental health professionals. Um, and so actually, I'm gonna go to this and then I'll go back to the next last slide. Um, but basically why I'm here today and my main ask uh, for the student government is I want to get some help um, spreading the word about my committee and my organization to get students on campus to be involved in this process. Um, and then also if any of the committee members know other orgs um, who can assist with this as well and create relationships. 
Um, and then if anybody knows, anybody who may or may not be a Medicaid member who may want to jump in and help with some of that Medicaid member committee organizing, um, because all of this really influences a lot of stuff on campus. I actually just talked to the Rary Health Center this morning, um, and they showed me this top stat the, of the students of MSU Denver for spring 2023, taking nine credits or more, because that's the only data we have on insurance base. So it's the students who have waived out of the school's insurance. Of the 8,775 waivers, 2,568 were covered by Medicaid, which is just under 30%. Um, so that's a good number of our population. And I also work in the student care center with the HOPES program. So I actually work directly as a peer mentor to a number of these students who are on Medicaid and other government assistance programs. Um, and part of my internship, I've also been examining the network adequacy for Colorado Medicaid behavioral health. And there's only 8,883 Medicaid mental health providers across the whole state. Um, and only 3,772 of those are uh, mental health providers who don't prescribe medication and are not associated with mental health centers. Um, and also, I just want the last piece of thanking the Rare Health Center for finally accepting Medicaid because it's been a long time coming. I think that's open for questions. Okay, let's open the floor to discussion. We have. Uh, Paul, then Alan. I'm happy to connect with the students. I know that'd be interested in forwarding this goal, and I know some folks who'd probably even want to come down to the Capitol. The uh, Raria Cross Disability Alliance that comes to mind immediately. Um, so I know we've talked previously yeah. about that, Matt. So I'm happy to, you know, let the rubber hit the road, and we'll go forward with that. And um, but thank you for engaging in this work. It's uh, someone who's been on Medicaid before and struggled with the health system. It's 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 really in heart. It's it it's uh warms my heart to know that you know a lot yeah. of people are committed to seeing change happen in a positive direction with this. And so I commend you for the effort you're putting in today. And thanks for coming in. Yeah, thank you. And all yep. the work that I'm doing is um, with current and former Medicaid members. Yes, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Paul. Um, on to Alan. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Is this the same group I saw you with last week that you were taking a group of people, about 20 people or something, up to Estes Park to enjoy themselves? That was actually the HOPES program that I work with in the Student Care Center. So my internship is focused on the advocacy stuff at like the state level, and then I also work with students on government assistance programs. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. I saw him outside in the parking lot, and there was probably, what, 20 to 30 people mm -hmm. out there. And, you know, went up to Estes Park just to have a good time over the, to get them out of the city and just go have a good time. What you're doing is incredible, so good mm -hmm. job for college. Thank you. Yep. In the HOPES program, we have about 80 students right now, and we're still building. So we're trying to tap into that under 30% of Medicaid covered students. That's really awesome. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you. And Dan, did you still have a question? Hey, Matthew, uh, thank you for your work. Um, are you still, is the Colorado Student Government Coalition, is that um, someone you're still connected with and that has access to students or is or should we reconnect you with them? Oh, was it Abby McAdams, or um, is that is, is that is that are you still connected with them for this at all? Um, I'm a little bit connected with Abby still. Um, I know they have kind of, like most of you all, um, taken on a lot and been overcome with a lot of things. Um, so if I can get tapped in some of the other universities across the state too, because I want to hit more than just like college and university students, but I also want to make sure that like. Denver's not the only one dominating the conversation, as it normally does. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of my concern. Some of the meetings are canceled sometimes and stuff, so I was just wondering if that was actually in, came to fruition. So, yeah. yeah, so part of it, I was going to see if I can get a recording of this and then try and actually work with the other student governments and kind of show them what I'm doing as well. Yeah, it'll be public. Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Um, on to Taylor. Thank you. Um, so can we go back to the slide where you have the ask for what you'd like us to do? Because anything, any support that we can do, we need to make a motion first that we're going to do that thing. So I want to know what exactly we should be motioning on. Um, so part of it is helping spread awareness. So 
whether that's actively taking a role in helping spread like my message and flyer and helping get people connected with me or um, like some of the other committee members have already done is sharing resources for me to make that connection or if any of you have any specific skills within organizing or, or want to take a you know anybody wants to take on an extra project and work directly with me um, on the organizing piece within the organization um, they don't have to be a Medicaid member at that point just to kind of help me keep things moving along and growing Awesome, thank you. And then Dan. So I motion that the PR committee take on that first bullet point or arrow point. Seconded. Okay, I'm gonna start with Gabe. Yes. Uh, Mike. Yes. Paul. Yes. Dan. Yes. Alex. Yeah. Uh, uh, me. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Bree. Yes. James. Yes. Uh, any Mike? Okay. But my vote, even though I can't vote. <laughs> um, it passes. Wonderful. Um, is there anything else you would like to say, Matt? I appreciate all the help and again, if anybody else has any connections or referrals for anything, I'm always up to it. That's really what I like to do is organize and connect and meet people. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are going on to Ramsey Michael on student housing. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Mike Ramsey. I am also new, came in on the first day with Mo here. Um, about a month ago. So I am the director of external affairs um, connected to the president's office. And yeah, I'm here for a couple of things. Um, one of the first projects that came to me on day two was about uh, housing rights and an event uh, to having hosting an event on campus with a community partner. Um, and so I've been talking to a lot of different people. Um, part of my job is going to be connecting dots around campus making sure we can get the right people um, connected to the right programs, the right projects, the right opportunities. Um, and then that's across um, demographics, that's across uh, positions. So we're talking everything from students uh, to faculty, to staff, to leadership, um, trying to make sure everybody who is interested in something um, has hands on a certain project and we make it as intentional as possible. Um, so it's kind of serendipitous that Mo's also here um, with James and Abby uh, talking about uh, FAR you know, um, I would say long term plans for student housing uh, because this one is talking about student housing, but student housing rights and they would like to host an event here. So I am here on behalf of them asking for um, sponsorship from student government. We know that this is a goal for student government. And so, yeah, I'm here to present that idea, um, see if you're interested and try to connect dots where I can. Um, so this organization is the Denver Metro Fair Housing Center. Um, their executive director is a uh, alum, I think from 77. Uh, so graduated at MSU 77, created this just a few years ago actually, and trying to push for um, people that are experiencing change in their housing uh, all around Denver, right? A lot of gentrification, a lot of people being pushed out um, there's housing rights that are associated with that and spreading that knowledge and making sure people have their um, that knowledge they can fight back justly um, is what this organization is about. So it's a small team, only about four people, um, but they do a lot. They actually last year did a event, I think partially sponsored by CMEI um, and in conversations with Armando um, and Gabe and um, Chad, they said it was a it was a good event. People enjoyed it. Uh, this was something they, you know, I think they just did like an hour session, uh, talked about rights, things like that, um, had some questions and answers and even some resources there for students and staff. Um, so it was well attended, uh, a successful event and uh, something that is already seeming to get some uh, waves here on campus. Um, and so what they want to do is do a half day seminar on fair housing rights and housing issues like uh, the racial home ownership gap. Uh, disability rights in housing, 
um, and a whole assortment of different things. Um, and they do have a, a, uh, a draft of an agenda, but that's actually being created right now, uh, partially with some people from MSU that we'll get into a little bit later, um, students and faculty. Um, and so that's what they would like to do. They do already have a keynote speaker who is a uh, Mercedes Maestas uh, from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, so HUD. Um, and that's already locked in. So that's and now they're starting to build a program around her and, and her um, drive. Uh, and it's going to be April 25th is the date that they settled on. Uh, they would like to do uh, eight, between eight and one. Um, not very flexible on that date just because the keynote uh, speaker is official, but we can always work with that uh, if we need to. Um, uh, they have selected the Tivoli Turn Hall as their first option. They've already had uh, tours with people. Um, they've already reached out to AHEC. Um, things are in motion already. So they are really, um, really just want to make this happen and looking for some support and some sponsorship, an official sponsor, I should say. Um, they do have space for panel discussions uh, and breakout space, a media room, and um, are also looking to feed people um, that are attending this event. Uh, I think a little bit of breakfast and uh, a larger lunch. So, you know, whatever is possible. And I know those details can get figured out later, um, but just wanted to prep you on that. Um, and so those panel discussions also, they would like student representation. Um, so they would like to hear from students about um, some of the issues that they've been going on or some of the knowledge that they would like to pass on to others. Um, and that, again, details can be figured out later, but uh, that's what they would like. That's what they're interested in and very open to that. Um, and so my part, again, part of my reason for being here is to share that why, right? Not only the what, um, which I can send you those details and all the all the uh, things that I have lined up right now, I can send those to you after this, um, but also to express that why. Um, there's already signaling a high interest in affordable housing and the housing rights, um, not only in Denver, not only in the Metro Denver, but also here on campus. Uh, we're noticing that um, just doing some research online, talking to faculty, this is a hot topic. Um, and so I think it would be amazing if, if MSU could be a part of this and host something like this, uh, which I haven't seen in Denver. I've been doing community work for quite some time here. Um, so I haven't seen it like like to this degree and for this population specifically. Uh, so I think that'd be uh, wildly valuable um, and something that's super interesting. So um, there's also uh, MSU support. Uh, we have two deans who would like to support uh, both financially and with staff uh, if we can. Uh, we have two faculty members already on the planning committee, uh, one in the Department of Social Work, one with the Department of Political Science, um, and they already have student assist uh, starting to work on different content and just starting to get speakers ready, panelists ready, things like that. Uh, so it's very fresh. It's very new right now. Um, the logistics are set and it's time to just fill in the gaps. Um, after that, we have, I know this was a, a direct connection to the student government goals as well. Um, which is what uh, Gabe and um, Chad told me about. So that was a, it seemed like a natural connection right there. Um, and then lastly uh, is, is the, oh, sorry about that. I missed one thing. Oh yeah, they are looking for uh, more student participation on the um, planning committee as well. So if someone does wanna be involved in that, they are open to space around that. So that's the why, you know, it just seems like a natural fit. Um, this is again, we can I can always connect you to uh, Denver Metro Fair Housing. They can make it today. Um, so I can definitely connect you. You can talk to the team. Uh, they can they like to come here on campus again. We have an alum, so um, she's happy to be involved with whatever you need to if you want to to continue. Um, and so the needs, the direct needs are um, for to have a official university partner, um, which is would be uh, student government, I believe. Um, and then uh, financial assistance for the room reservation and food for attendees, uh, assistance in marketing, uh, which could be connected through our Maricoms team here um, and our events team, uh, which is which does help out for student facing events um, and is a wonderful new team. I think they just brought on their head here for I think like a couple like a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago. Um, but she's wonderful and she's all about student facing events. So um, there's support there. And, and then student perspectives. Uh, so that would be the needs and the asks. Um, and then now I'm here for questions. All right, Dan. So um, for the cost, uh, you're 
for food and then rental space, what's that anticipated? How many people are expected, I guess, or hoping to be there at the event? And then what, what is that going to look like in cost for food? Yeah. Um, so I couldn't get the, um, the suggestion back in time. I'm assuming from my own event experience and some of the conversations with the events team, uh, they would like around 100 to 150 people participating in this if we can. Uh, so the turn hall at Tivoli, I think, is uh, estimated at with a partner discount at $1,500. Uh, and food, I'm assuming, um, between four and $5,000. That's on the high side. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Taylor? Um, I just want to say that we definitely are interested in be, having students go on the panel. For sure, we were yes to that. Um, I think we'll. I am. We'll have to vote on all this, <laughs> but um, I think that is a great opportunity. I also think that um, having students on the planning committee as well—that's another thing that I really do support. I think students should be involved in all of these discussions. Um, and I don't see a problem with the marketing. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts. The five thousand—that is quite a sum. That is another thought. Okay. <laughs> Sure, just a quick thing on that. We do also, the deans um, did say that they would also support with finances too, so. Awesome, uh, Mike? Yes, that was my question as well, because um, um, you said $5,000. I assumed, I didn't know if you wanted us to get take our budget or the other deans are gonna pitch in too, so I was just curious to elaborate further on that, like where the, where the financials you think would be, would be coming from. Uh, I would say that we could make the financials happen. Um, that's again part of my role is to help with that piece. Um, if if student government has their own budget budget and can support, that'd be great. But it's all about how we can split this with other colleges and people that are interested too. Uh, we're not trying to do um, put put it all on one group. Um, this is for everyone that uh is interested in this so um i think there's a lot of interest i think we can make that money piece happen um i did not have a formal plan though for the budget um but i'm very um i'm here to for the for the conversation of course and i'm um, just add on to that i'm i in terms of sponsoring i could absolutely absolutely say sponsoring this event and um pitching some money towards this event um as long as we're not f fully fundable but um definitely with that sponsorship, I think there should be some added expectation. Like, you know, let's actually put some money behind it to make this happen. So I, that's my thoughts on it. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dan. And so then hypothetically, we do, there is some money pitched to this and we co-sponsor it. Would we, would we have like our name on the event information and be giving credit for the, you know, the co-sponsorship or the donating or any of that stuff? Definitely, um, they are very happy to share um, who made this happen um, and how that shows up. Uh, we can, I think that's going to be through the details, uh, but we could also, you know, um, make a deal before anything happens um, and put that on paper. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Hi, I don't really have a question, more, more of a statement. Um, I really appreciate the work you all are doing. I think it's really good and really important. Um, I was living in my car at one point going to school here and I had to withdraw from classes because of that. And a lot of the students that I talk to, they find it like entirely unacceptable that there are homeless students here, right? Uh, you know, and if, if you continue to look at this retention thing, um, housing is a big part of that. Housing is a huge de detrimental part. Um, so I don't think that anyone on this council would really oppose of supporting the event that you have. Thank you. Appreciate you sharing that. And I think that's also that also reminds me that um, having a space for resources for students um, and and the families that students are living with or connected to um, or faculty and staff um, having resources at this event could be something that uh, we bring in as well. Um, that's not talked about yet, and I think that could be a gap um in the effectiveness of this uh event so um i appreciate you bringing that up because it'd be amazing if we could talk have people talk to people right then and there wonderful we now have paul then naomi then alan um i wanted to speak to um why even the 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 the, the, the high estimate of the cost would not be a big cost for this council i think 
you know, we put 6,000 into the food for finals, understanding that it wasn't just a giveaway. It was an investment in our students and their ability to succeed academically. You know, can't pass a final without a full belly. It's even more true that you can't do very well in your finals when you have to deal with a ton of like housing insecurity problems. Right. Um, and so it seems to me like, you know, it's less money than we put towards the finals for food. And it has the potential for even greater impact in terms of long-term, like let's attack that 10% graduation number, right? Like let's like get back to the basics of like, you know, how does someone succeed in school? It's with a roof over their head, some food in their belly and, you know, like adequate supplies and everything like that. We've got the supplies. We've been attacking food insecurity. This is a really good way for us to round out that whole goal and the whole mission that we've talked about at the beginning of the year is by having a nice big, housing event like this you know i'm really excited sounds great that's wonderful thanks thank you paul on the naomi alan then me we do have a minute and 30 seconds so just one point of clarification um you guys are this is like transitional so you're inviting like all the university or all the colleges here uh to this event so community college of denver uc denver and then um us as well right i believe so um but if this is something that you know, this is the MSU team. So if this is something that right now we need to focus uh, for MSU students and staff, I think that's OK. Um, and I think though that can happen in those conversations uh, with the Denver Metro Fair Housing. OK, sweet. And then the question uh, I had was if you're doing this transitutionally and then also here as well, have you guys reached out to other departments here on campus to, for funding? Because um, they'll definitely be interested in helping you as well, even if we can only donate so much. Um, and then also, have you reached out to the other universities to provide you funding as well? Because they also have uh, student governments at UC Dem or C of Denver. Um, I don't know about Community College of Denver because, you know, they're little, but would they matter? So have, I just want to know if you guys had reached out to them as well. I uh, have not reached out to the different universities, have definitely been talking to uh, different colleges and departments, though. And there is support there. Yep. Q on to Alan. Uh, Ramsey, thank you. I love how these three groups are overlapped really well and uh, they line up perfectly with our council's stated goals when we got together at the beginning of this year to retreat and came up with what we wanted and it's kind of neat to see it all in action and uh, I definitely support it if uh, we can afford it uh, financially is that that's just you know for one thing and uh, I think it's something that we should do and we should all try to get involved with great to hear thank you um, OK, we are out of time, but I think we should pick a couple people to work on this, develop a motion and then bring it for next week. Is there any volunteers? I don't Paul, volunteer. Mike, Gabe. OK, Paul, Mike and Gabe. OK, thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to add real quick. I think the care center would would be willing to get behind this too. Okay, on to. Oh. Yes, go ahead. Again, as part of the HOPES program, I would love to connect and see, I don't know how much financial, but see how we can support each other because we're actually working on some of the workshops. Wonderful. We'll connect after. Okay, wonderful. Um, I realize that we did not do our elections update, so let's go do the elections update. Hi, everybody. Uh, most of you know me, uh, and I suppose for those who don't, um, too bad. Anyway, uh, uh, since this is my uh, officially first day, um, uh, you know, as you're aware, elections are coming up. Um, I think it's though it hasn't been officially decided yet. It's prudent uh, we're to plan around them occurring on the 14th to uh, match with the other institutions. Uh, that'd be April 14th specifically. Um, so I just want to drop some quick updates um, for you. Um, we're gonna uh, we're going ahead. We're gonna do ranked choice voting again, specifically uh, single transferable vote. Um, and on that note, we'll be putting out a timeline of how the election will be structured. Um, Armando and I are working together to get that out. So hopefully, very soon, that'll be publicly available to see what's coming up. 
Um, additionally, uh, last go around, um, I felt it was necessary to isolate elections from uh, TSAC uh, to make sure they go forward. I don't want to do that again. Um, so this time I'd like to work more with TSAC on making sure elections can be as, be as uh, the best that they could possibly be. Um, and so additionally, uh, I've uh, been laying groundwork of working with the uh, other institutions, CU Denver, but hopefully CCD as well on doing more transitional events and being able to combine our budgets and efforts and labor um, to hopefully have more prominent events. Uh, so, but on that note, uh, three things I would like the council to think about is one, uh, and this is more of a logistical thing, um, for candidate applications, uh, the job descriptions is an important part. So those of you who hold those job descriptions um, if you could either, I could send you and you could take a look at the current ones, update them, revise them as you see fit. So that could be passed around and more accurately describe what your job is. Um, next, uh, additionally, a big uh, aspect of mine, because uh, this was preferably the last uh, year I do elections, um, I want to pass the torch on. And so any of any of y'all, but especially you poli sci uh, majors, if you have any freshmen or sophomores that you could sucker into working with me for two weeks um, to understand the process and see how it goes so that they can hopefully take over this position going forward and keep continuity. Um, so anyway, like I said, if you can you know, ask around, promote this, see if anyone's interested. Obviously, it will be a paid position, um, so that's always a good incentive. Uh, and then lastly, um, think about uh, events that you guys want to hold. A lot of my thinking right now is just how to pass this along and make sure it works and make sure it's really good and make sure that it doesn't require institutional knowledge to be carried forward. Um, but that also means that I won't be spending as much time thinking about possible events. So hopefully that's where TSAC can come in and help out organizing, planning, that kind of stuff and getting out because that does require groundwork. Um, but additionally, uh, anywhere else that the elections team could potentially assist TSAC in any of its processes as well. Um, so like I said, now that I'm officially on, uh, I'll be hanging out in that back office. Um, yes, it's dark and scary, and that's how I like it, but the door is always open. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Now on to our old business. Uh, I'd like to make a point of, or um, I forgot what, what motion I'm trying to make. Um, I'd like to remove something from the agenda that added. Um, of new business section G. Um, I'm going to discuss that next week. OK, cool. On to Point of order. That's what I'm going to say. Sorry. Um, on to the resolution to address accountability violations. Paul. It's been read before, so I won't just immediately read it again, but rather throw out the motion to read it again, just for folks that haven't been a part of the process for a longer period and haven't read it. Motion to read the resolution. I motion to have you read the resolution. So we have a second. Anybody oppose? I am. Um, I think, I mean, it's pretty well knowledge. Yeah. Um, I think it should go to a vote and then just. OK, yeah, let's put it to a vote. OK, um, so voting to read the resolution. Um, we'll start with Gabe. Gabe. Abstain. Mike. No. Paul. Yes. Dan. Yes. Alex. Yeah. Me. Uh, yes. Uh, Taylor. No. Re. Abstain. And James. No. The yeses have it. Let's hear the resolution. All righty. So I got it pulled up here. And I can send it in the chat again for folks that are just viewing now. All right, I thought I had the link. Sorry, one moment. Apologies for the delay. All right, there we are. All right. And so this is a resolution to address accountability violations. Uh, whereas the Accountability Council has noted in their recognition that there is a lack of accountability within the council. Uh, whereas 
per the Fifth Amendment of our Constitution, the Judiciary Committee is charged to enforce the SGTSAC Constitution and the Handbook. Whereas, per Article 3, Section 1, quote, all students will be treated as equals and with respect. There shall be no exclusion of any student, regardless of race, gender, creed, religion, class, and political opinion. Any council member who violates these terms shall be held accountable by the council and risk impeachment from SGTSAC. Whereas, our handbook section on conduct says, quote, counselors shall not coerce or intimidate any person or engage in any speech or conduct which is discourteous, abusive, profane, obscene, or threatening. Whereas each training course with Gita, including those recommended for Alan Williams, must be scheduled four to six weeks in advance. Whereas an appointment with Gita has not been scheduled at this time, at the time of the writing of this resolution, nor has any apology been made to the council per the accountability committee's recommendations that were approved by the council. Therefore, be it hereby further resolved that the council recognizes that the behavior of Alan Williams in our council has, in our council chat has been discourteous, abusive, and profane. Therefore, be it hereby further resolved that the council recognizes that the prescribed steps that have been approved by the council have not been seriously pursued by Alan Williams. Therefore, be it hereby further resolved that the council will recognize that the recommendations voted on by the council have not been met and that Alan Williams will be removed from the council effective immediately. That's it. I motion that we table this indefinitely. I second that motion. Cool. Hey, um, we'll open it up for voting. <laughs> we, Can we discuss the point of clarification. What do you mean indefinitely? Like we just kills the, bill. the table, kills the bill. So we don't have to hear it again. We should discuss that motion. A motion has been made. It needs to be voted on. Yep. The mo yeah. Okay. Our handbook says that before we vote on things, there is a chance to speak and discuss. Here, I will I will clarify your motion, Dan. A motion to end discussion now. I second that. I would like to discuss that very motion. The one to railroad Allen off the council? No, the one to railroad this resolution. Which resolution? This one. So this one's just been made. So before a discussion Last. is even made, we're having a vote to table it. So that no one can discuss it. And we I'm, discussed I discussed it last dis week. I can't even discuss the vote to table it. And so this to me seems like the real suppression. Last happening. week we had no, 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 no. Okay, so let's just be clear and let's just let each other have a minute here. So do we want to motion to first table it or do we want to, because uh, we are supposed all to of, let him have a discussion. I'll, I'll amend my that. motion. Okay. So we're gonna have a discussion. I do motion that we limit this till 425. The discussion for this till 425 and then we vote. I have a mo I I need no. to withdraw my motion for that to happen because I motioned first to end discussion. Are you gonna withdraw it? I don't plan on draw it. No, I motioned something and I wanted to vote it on. I'm so confused. Point of order clarity from the Well, yeah. I'm look, very this, confused too. What do you what do you guys want? I'm, can I make we're not gonna railroad Alan off of it. We can't. If he gets free reign to speak. I want it to. Well, then just okay. speak. So either chair. Okay, I'm gonna need you guys to speak. please table this discussion for a second, James. Thank we you. We did for that last week. I think we should start with the original motion, which was the emotion. Which one was it? Yours or yours? To table it indefinitely. Yes, we should start with that one first because that was the first motion made. Yeah. Let's start there. Oh okay. crap. Okay. okay. I withdraw my motion, and we will discuss the motion to in tables indefinitely. All right. Is that correct? Is that yes. what's correctly going on here? Let's discuss. Let's All right, limit this vote. Mission, how, how about we limit it for 10 minutes, the discussion? Okay. Um, Paul, then Dan, then Naomi. Well, this needs to be talked about because there's a lot of smoke and mirrors going on right now about what happened last semester, about the accountability process as though it was some horrible, unjust political assassination. None of that is true. Please take everything that has been said in this meeting with a uh, grain of salt and look at the facts. We can look at what the uh, accountability committee came up with last semester and draw from there your own conclusions, right? Don't just take my word for it. Don't take his word for it. Look at what the accountability committee described happened and why we took those actions and what, what simple restorative steps were taken to offer a chance to A, Learn about why what he said was wrong, about genocide denial, why that's wrong. It's the decolonial training. Why uh, why all these other comments are wrong. That's the other trainings, the sensitivity trainings. And why there needs to be an apology made to his peers here, whom he has blatantly and flagrantly disrespected time and time again, including our advisors. Something we should take seriously. As, as, as advocates here, we're all being paid by the students. And so, you know, accountability, accountability to me also means 
taking serious when a counselor has totally derelicted their role. And so, you know, it needs to be recognized that people on this council aren't all participating in the job of student advocacy counselor, and we haven't even gotten there yet. We're still just talking about, like, like abusive things to say in genocide now. We haven't even gotten to the notion of, like, he hasn't done a lot of work for this counselor, for these students. And the idea that he has, well, let's see it. I'd like to see it. You know, I can speak to the work I've been doing and show should everybody else be able to. Um, but there's a lot of deception going on in the meeting today. I just want to point that out. Okay, thank you, Paul, then Dan, then Naomi, then me. So I don't agree with genocide denial. I don't agree with cultural misappropriation. We live in America. We have the right to say whatever we want to say. I don't, I think he should apologize. But if he's going to be, I think that if Alan is to be given classes or taking classes, he's got to be given a list. When I talked to Thomas Raglan, he said, yeah, we'll, we'll get a list together. And Thomas Raglan also said that generally, and the way the university does it, is they start with the lowest and move up forward. So all of us, Chad, James, and me, who were on the accountability committee, didn't even get a vote in this because we started with the harshest first. And for basically what was, you know, yeah, genocide denial. I believe that there was genocide, but the United States government has not said that that genocide happened to, United States, to, to the Native Americans either. So um, I believe Alan has the right to freedom of speech. And I mean, yeah, there, there has been a lot of deception today. Take it with a grain of salt. But that to go back to Mike's resolution two weeks ago or three weeks ago, it says, and it passed, it said all past behaviors will be forgiven. But, but it didn't say except for Alan's. It just said all past behaviors. You brought a resolution last week that said, I, I motioned, which was smart. I motioned to strike those words and then kick Helen off immediately. Well, the ones to strike those words failed. So technically he should be forgiven. This was tabled last week. And, you know, I mean, I think Alan has, this is an institution of education. Yeah, he may say things. I, mean, I don't agree with what he says, but he has the right to say them. This isn't a socialist or place where people try to control, you know, one party system where people try to control what other what, what the dissent says. You know what I mean? Yeah, we just, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, I was ignorant maybe on his part. And I, I'm not protecting what he said. I'm protecting his right to be able to say it, because if we don't have the right to be able to say it. What's the point? Why are we in school? That's all I have for right now. Thank you, Dan. On to Naomi, then me, then James, then Alan. Oh, am I disappointed? I would just like to first and foremost say we are going to the extent of where we are taking precaution or we're taking the disciplinary actions of least to then greatest by giving him the opportunities. And I'm going to emphasize very hard on this. Do not interrupt somebody when they are talking anymore, please. Now, back to what I was saying. We are starting at the very minimum, then going up to the maximum. And you can shake your head and tell me that we're wrong, but we have given him very simple, very simple things to go and do. They require taking a class and getting educated, which is why we are in school, to get educated, to take on different perspectives, and then to just simply apologize like a reasonable adult, to have an emotional sense of intelligence, to talk about each other's feelings, even if you don't agree with them, to just validate those emotions. Something that we don't seem to do very well in this council, not just between this person, but everybody else as well. We need to be able to validate one another's feelings, emotions, and cultural boundaries. And that is something that I have seen being failed many times, especially by this one particular individual. Now, yes, we are in America 100%. We do have a right to speak and say what we want to say. However, we are in an institution where what we say is therefore dictated by not us, but the institution, which means we referred to the code of conduct saying that when he is disrupting those policies and not going or are going against those and disrespecting those cultural boundaries and people's uh, cultural identity, that is then going against the code of conduct. Hence why we developed a judiciary committee. Now, I don't think that it is fair that we're going to sit here and dismiss those. And I agree with this resolution. It does need to be talked about because you can't just sit here and let someone go against the code of conduct and disrespect someone's cultural identity and then somebody else's gender identity or I'm sorry, not gender identity, but other beliefs as well. Say what you want, but don't be don't be in disbelief when there are consequences to your actions. And this is America. Everyone says that it's free, but it's not. There are consequences to everything you do and say. 
And if you're going to sit here and claim to be an ally, especially for indigenous students, and then sit here and just try to protect somebody who is going against the terms of genocide being created or being ha or ha had happened on this land, this is stolen land. And the best part about that is that as America, we still don't educate people on that. We still don't hold ourselves accountable as Americans. We don't hold any accountability for that. So to sit there and say that you need any kind of justification as to saying that that's not what happened here is quite disturbing, especially as an ally. I'm just talking. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Dan, you're on the stack. Um, it is my turn now. And then James, Alan, then Dan. What my confusion about this resolution is that nowhere does it state in the resolution that we need two thirds for this to pass. But my confusion about this resolution is that in our governing documents, it requires three weeks, three weeks to remove somebody off of the council. There is a written procedure in there. And this resolution, it just completely ignores that. That is my confusion. Um, thank you. On to James. Okay, right. this is probably the last thing I will say on this because quite frankly, I'm tired of this repeating myself. First off, to Dan's thing about the past violations, Amendment 5 specifically says all past violations of the bylaws and the rules will be forgiven with the passing of this amendment. We forgave our governing structure violations. MSU Denver Student Code of Conduct outweighs anything we do because every student on this campus is subject to it. I don't get to decide who is forgiven for not, okay? What we need to do, and we've talked to Raglan about this, is he said, yes, next time we need to ensure that we involve him. However, he did say that we should give Alan to the end of the month as dictated by the Accountability Committee last semester. That is exactly what my memo states, is he has until the end of February. If he does his recommendations, he's off the hook. He is forgiven. I will withdraw the memo. Second, Yes, we have freedom of speech, but to what Naomi said, freedom of speech protects your right to speak. It does not protect you from the consequences of your speech, especially at the institutional level. That is something that most people need to understand. Freedom of speech is not absolute. There are plenty of Supreme Court cases that prove exactly what I'm saying, and I'm officially done with this topic because it is ridiculous. I would recommend we immediately just withdraw this resolution, allow the memo to take place, give Allen until the end of the month as we all agreed upon in December. Thank you, James. On to Alan, then Dan, then Paul. Yes, uh, this is exactly why I asked all this. Uh, I went to the dean's office and asked them to take care of this because some of what you all are saying I agree with, and it should all occur through the university with a true third party because I believe I've had uh, student code violations from you all on me too, and I have a right to a fair and impartial group to administer the restorative justice program if they so deem. I don't think that this flattened government structure, which I need to remind everybody, we do have a flattened government structure, and it's in human nature when you have something like this, uh, for human beings to want to create another power structure to sit or do harm to other human beings. I, I haven't done that, but you all have. I think it's really important that the student body understand who you all are and what you've done and to violate our flattened government structure. Because if you do this, we don't have a flattened government structure. We have a small group of mad students that don't like the fact that I asked in a public meeting to strike the word genocide out of a bill I really wanted to vote for. I wanted to vote for that. And uh, I was really just trying to, I thought, help uh, pass that bill along as it gets farther in, in discussion or wherever it's gonna go. I thought that would help to bring people on all sides together. Um, and there was a few other things mentioned in the original uh, punishment day in that public meeting, and it's all public, it's all recorded. Um, you guys completely talking about things that I've debated on and I have every right to, in this elected position, uh, dispute some things that you guys think and say in public, and that's what we're all here for. So um, I really believe this, this thing you're voting on right now does violate not only the constitution of, of TSAC, but it's, it's really not allowing the chance for the university dean's office to do a, a valid investigation. Um, and that's to all of our behavior, not just mine. It's true restorative justice. It's not just a bunch of people against me. And I, I'm not going to give up uh, with my voice and using my voice 
to stand against you people that are trying to, it's, it's, you know, we're trying to prove this flat government works. And the only way we can do it is by not creating other power structures that exist and were created only to harm other people on this council. And it's not doing any good for our image either. It embarrasses all of us. Um, these kind of squabbles we're constantly having over the fact that you guys are angry, that you don't like what I have to say, things like that. I am of a different generation, but you can't expect me to just bow down to everything that you do and say. So I would hope that you all come to your common sense and let this process take its proper course through the university, because I can assure you that the dean's office will be fair and impartial. Point of order. What is the time left on the debate? You said 10 minutes. We have until 425. Motion to extend by five minutes. Seconded. I am against that motion. OK, well, then vote now. We will put it on a vote. That's how I, uh, that's how I'm saying it. I'm against it. So that's how we vote now. OK, um, anyway, Gabe. Gabe. OK, there we go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can I find my mute, unmute button? Um, I no. No. Uh, Mike. Uh, no. Paul. Yes. Dan. Yes. Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Me. Um. Abstain. Taylor. No. Bree. No. And James. No. It is a tie, so it does not pass. I do motion to table this because it does need to continue to be discussed. I know that everyone is tired of this, um, but this is something that definitely needs to be discussed. Um, so I motion to table this to old business next meeting. A second. Point of order, the end of discussion was, I believe, for the yes. discussion on whether or not we were tabling this bill. Yes. Right? Yeah. So that good. discussion is ended, so we should vote on whether or not this is being tabled. As that, opposed to that table was indefinitely. So now we vote on tabling indefinitely. So you're the table it indefinitely. We were we were that's what I was saying. At least we were discussing that's what that debate was first. Okay, wait, one person at a time. So table indefinitely as in I can offer some clarity different here. Types of tabling. Go ahead. So you had motioned during the question of tabling indefinitely, right? That we limit discussion. And that was for the pending motion, which was to table indefinitely. We limited that discussion until 425, 425, 424 hit, and then we thought we were talking about it. Um, and that failed to extend it. And so now we'll basically be voting on the on just what you just motioned. And so we just have to call the vote on it. And you could probably do it by who opposes. We want to go through this again Is that next clear? week. We so went through three weeks in a row. To clarify, we are tabling this till next week. Is the motion? Right. It's ridiculous. I definitely was what was said. That was the motion. The motion is to table indefinitely, which means so filling the bill. But we could do it until March 1st. OK, OK, OK. So we're voting on this to be tabled indefinitely. Yes. OK, thank you. OK, all right. Um, Gabe. Abstain. Mike. Yes. Paul. No. Dan. Yes. Alex. Yeah. Uh, me abstain. Taylor. Yes. Bree. Yes. And James. Yes. All right. This motion has been resolution, whatever we want to call it, has been tabled indefinitely. Um, on to the next order of business. We do have two minutes left, and that is for the core request discussion. Motion to table whatever's left for the next meeting. I second. I second. OK, let's go into voting. All right, Gabe. Yes. Mike. Yes. Paul. Yes. Dan. No. Uh, uh, Alex, sorry. Point of clarification, what are we voting on again? To table everything till next. Uh, yes, okay. yes. Uh, me, yes. Taylor. Taylor, yes. And Ree. Yes. And James. <laughs> yes. Cool. OK, the rest of our agenda has been tabled for next week, and that concludes our meeting today. Thank you all so much. I'm so excited for next week. Have a great weekend. Have a, make good choices.